Well, hey everyone, Coach Gary Michelone here. I um, want to welcome you to uh, today's webinar. And before we get started, can I just give a, a, a shout out, a great big thank you to MCAA, especially Tim O'Toole and, and to uh, Masonry Magazine, um, especially its editor, Jennifer Morell. You know, our industry is so blessed and fortunate to have available the resources that the association brings to us. And this webinar, this series of webinars, uh, is brought to you by some sponsors. And Tim was speaking about them just a little bit ago. And, uh, you know, here they are again. And you know these sponsors, you've done business with them, and we know, we trust that you will continue to uh, grow in your relationship with them and, and build your businesses uh, together. We look forward to that and to the, uh, the involvement over the, the coming months and years of these sponsors with MCAA. Well, one of the fun things that, that we're accomplishing today is, is raising awareness and money for the Masonry Industry Scholarship Fund. MCAA offered a speaking fee to me for this webinar. And, you know, I just asked them to, to donate to the scholarship fund and to challenge others to match it. So I hope that you did. And if you haven't, well, please do. So that together we can we can reach out, we can touch the future, uh, somebody's future that way. And I'm going to trust that many of you will do just that today. So now, let's talk about today's message. Because I want you to take it to heart. Because if you do, it could change your business and change your life. Mostly my message today is, is to encourage you, to remind you where you're coming from, your heritage in the, in the building industry, in, in your country, in community, your family, and, and life. So here's the question. Who's Coach Gary? Why listen to me? Well, you know, not everyone knows me, so who am I? Why should you listen to me? Well, some of you know me from my full contact PM column in, in Masonry these past uh, six years. The rest of you may just be finding out about me today for the very first time, but I invite you to not be a stranger to Masonry Magazine and, and to my column. The editors over at Masonry are kind enough to archive my column, so just about everything that I've ever written for them is available there. And you know, you counting the print issues for Masonry Magazine and the several other magazines I've written for, there are some two million columns of mine in print somewhere, and I, I'm very thankful for, for that opportunity. But you know what? My background probably is a lot like yours. I was a, a site work contractor. I did grading, demo, underground. I was a project manager, a superintendent, a grade checker, an equipment operator, a laborer, estimator, change order getter, payroll maker, receivables collector. And I did that both as an owner and for other contractors. And one of my favorite titles besides dad is this one, which is working project manager. And I did that for multiple decades. These days, though, mostly marketing and writing is, uh, is what I'm all about. I do have an education in marketing, but I also have one from the School of Hard Knocks. So I understand life on the job site. I know what it's like to put together a complete estimate only to see it go to a competitor who may have, may have kicked my butt but whose estimate was not so complete. And I know how frustrating that is. And I also know the joy of winning bids and, and not leaving any money on the table or, or even to being awarded a contract when I was the second or third low. Listen, it's the same stuff that you go through. Original, originally, my columns in Masonry were all about project management. So full contact PM was, uh, was, was, was the title of the column. And in July of, of 2006, things were good. 
there was lots of work. There was uh, the focus was on on of the columns was on being treated fairly by our clients and not doing free work. <laughs> Can you remember those days? Well, things have changed. Things have things have certainly changed. And for lots of us, they've just changed way too much. The book "Get Paid for a, a Change" came out in 2006. It was all about change orders and how to get them. You know, in the book, there's a lot of inside baseball when it comes to managing your changes to the original contract, and and that's what we covered in the column. So maybe someday we'll do a webinar uh, on that topic with managing changes. But again, things have changed. And they went from really good business climates to, to really bad. And I guess, I guess that's an understatement. And things started to get ugly. And then they got really ugly. And my column changed focus from, from project management to project leadership. And a big, big part of project leadership is hanging on. I think sometimes I must have sounded like, uh, like little orphan Annie singing, the sun will come out tomorrow. Apologies to little orphan Annie. You know, actually, little orphan Annie was, a, was originally a comic strip that came out of the Great Depression. And, and during that time, there were soup lines and there was high unemployment. It, hard to believe, but things were even worse then than they are in our current Great Recession. People needed hope. Yeah, hope. That's what Annie was singing about. We all need it. We all want it. How can we all get it? Well, that's what today's message is all about. So I want to talk about our economic and business situation today. So let's quickly look at how we got here. Now, some of you are out there saying, hey, coach, we don't want to learn about Annie. We want to learn about how to get through this mess of an economy. And what do you know about leading people through a mess? You're a project manager. Well, team, I hear you. And I'm going to answer to those questions in a moment. But you should know this. During these last several years, I suffered right along with you from losing work to real estate, uh, losing it, same as you. And in past years, I also got clobbered by weather and got clobbered by sky-high interest rates and clobbered by city bureaucracies that wouldn't issue building permits. Same as you. So I've been there. And these comments of mine are, are not some ivory tower academic principle shared by a professor who hasn't missed a paycheck in 20 years. No, this is real world stuff, things that I know, same as you. So let's get to my message, which is all about hanging on as long as it takes to complete the mission. My hope is that when we get done, you'll believe me that, that you can, that you can lead. Now, having just asked you to believe me, get ready for this, because I'm going to ask you to not believe me just yet. Huh? Well, that's why I've brought in a bunch of my friends, heroes, your friends and heroes too. It's kind of like a courtroom drama. I'm going to bring in the evidence and then let you decide, let you decide whether you can lead your team through absolutely anything. But as I said, don't decide yet. I want you to weigh the evidence first. And you're thinking, a courtroom uh, evidence? What's this? Team, yes, it's the, uh, the other side. The other side has its own legal and PR team. And, and, you know, for over five years now, they've been making the case that practically the end of the world is here. That things are nearly hopeless. And that you can't do anything on your own. So we need huge spending programs. That's the only way. Well, you've heard this argument for five years. So I want you to listen for the next several minutes, and I want you to do examine the evidence, because I intend to show you that your own leadership abilities can get us 
get you out of this mess. And if my friends and I can't persuade you, then I lose. Put another way, we all lose. Because while you're considering this, let me ask you, have, have you ever felt like it was just you up against the entire world? Is this you? You got all that weight on your shoulders? You, you can't fight a moment longer? It's just too heavy? Well, you know the feeling. So now, let's bring in our witnesses, our friends, different witnesses, and take a quick, close look at the other side of the argument. I'm going to listen to their stories about being confronted with overwhelming odds of their own and how they fared, and, and then decide if, if what you are facing is any worse. So I ask you, is that fair? I hope so. You know, we all share a heritage, a history, and, and that, that makes us what we are today. And, and part of what we share as Americans is the gift of leadership. Uh, remember that, as the old saying goes, that those who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it. And you need to know this next bit of history because because it's going to help you survive 2013 and beyond. Did you know that George Washington was almost nothing more than a mere footnote in history? Almost. But we remember him today as the great leader he was, such as in the famous uh, painting of him crossing the Delaware River on December 26, 1776. Why? Do you, do you know why? See, this begs the question, why, why did he cross the river back then and attack the British? And, and what are the implica implications for us today in our businesses? So what, what was he facing as Christmas approached? Well, Washington's army had lost more than half of its men to illness and desertion and enlistment expirations. He had an urgent need to inspire his troops with the confidence that they lacked, and he needed to do it quickly. He had also lost the confidence of several members of Congress who had reason to question his leadership because the war was going badly. Yes, badly. The idea of a United States was hanging on by a thread. But Washington knew that a surprise attack, ending in victory, could do that. It could inspire. And he also knew that in just a few more days, he had even more enlistments that were expiring. So Washington's forces got into their boats that evening of December 25th and began the crossing of the, of the Delaware River. And in the midst of a snowstorm that then changed to sleet, he, they, they moved across the river. But meanwhile, the enemy's uh, soldiers, they were nice and comfy. They were enjoying a, a night's sleep. But avoiding the ice flows, most of Washington's men continued to cross the river, although some of his artillery and some of his other soldiers could not get across. The weather was so bad that the attack, originally planned to occur under the cover of darkness, did not actually begin until 8 a.m. in broad daylight. But in spite of that, the troops of the Continental Army suffered only life ca light casualties, while the enemy had 100 of their own killed or wounded and another 900 captured. And the enemy also lost six cannon, 40 horses, and a huge amount of supplies, all of which were seized by Washington. Well, this marked the first victory of Washington's command over a a regular professional army in the field. and They defeated professional soldiers, actually mercenaries. The troops of Washington were inspired. In fact, they were so inspired that many re-enlisted. And new enlistments soared. And the rest, as they say, is history. Really, it's, it's U.S. history because this was a huge turning point in the war. Washington demonstrated to his troops 
his leadership abilities. He would expect nothing less from you as you work toward your own turning point. So here's a question for you, team. How wide is your Delaware River? And how tiny is your boat? Well, this type of leadership, fortunately for us, did not only occur once in our country's history, but has recurred continually and as often as situations dictate and our people need it. So consider another famous battle during the month of December, this time 1944, the Battle of the Bulge. During a German offensive, the 101st Airborne was encircled in the town of Bastogne, France. It was winter. The enemy had them surrounded. And it was, they were in such a bad situation that the German commander sent a message to the American commander demanding that he immediately surrender or face annihilation. What follows next is one of the greatest quotes ever to come from that war. U.S. Army General Anthony McAuliffe typed the reply, and here's how it went. To the German commander, nuts from the American commander. The Americans who delivered the message explained to the Germans receiving it that the one word message could be translated, go to hell. Heavy fighting continued, but the 101st held on, but not without cost. According to Wikipedia, this last major German offensive had cost the Germans 120,000 men, 1,600 planes, and 700 tanks. The Allies lost 80,000 killed, wounded, or missing. 75,000 of them were, were American. And as such, it was the single greatest battle toll in U.S. history. As you listen now, are you hunkered down in your own comfy quarters and maybe even there's a wolf at the door? But you have some competitors out there who are, who are in the same situation. Uh, dare we say the same boat? They are scared. They intend on remaining in their bunkers, hoping that things will all just go away and magically get better. But you know differently. You realize that you're the product of a glorious history. You still live in a fabulous country, and you have the freedom to do things that others in our world can only imagine. And so, as the year unfolds, I lay this challenge before you. Go on the offensive. Will you, like your forebears, seize the opportunities that you have right now? to increase or maintain market share, or will you leave those to others? Somebody will seize that opportunity because somebody always does. Just say nuts. It comes down to this. Even though it's, it's nasty outside sometimes, it's freezing cold, and no sane person would dare go out into that kind of weather, how about you? Will you get into the boat? And when others insist that you're crazy, that you are surrounded by debt, with little work and a nasty economy, will you give in? Or will you remember the leaders who came before you, spilled their own blood and that of the men they commanded, and have bestowed on you as a gift, fully paid by them, the mantle of leadership you now wear in your business? and simply say to the others, nuts. So you've got some obstacles and hurdles in your life. Stack them up against these two stories about D-Day, June 6, 1944, Normandy, France. Consider the leadership skills that were demonstrated this day, that many years ago, in defense of freedom. As contractors, we are all about management and leadership, and 
if we hope to be profitable. But some of our projects are small and some are much larger. Well, from a, from a PM perspective, D-Day was huge. And it seems appropriate to, to pause and to reflect upon what our greatest generation was able to accomplish, ensuring we'd even be here today and to talk about it. So could you do this? Hmm? Consider these statistics that are provided by the Portsmouth um, Museum in England. It was near the area where the troops were staged awaiting the landing. Arguably, arguably one of the largest military projects ever. These are the countries where your crew came from. This is on the Allies side. You can see all of the various countries there. Talk about a diverse crew. There it is. Your crew size. The amount of forces that were involved in this thing were huge. The Allies landed around 156,000 uh, troops in, in Normandy, and the American forces landed 73,000. Well, you can see the, the, the breakdown there on the beach. Huge crew size. You had an Air Force. Look at the, look at the amount of planes that you had. This is what it took to support the landings. So on D-Day, the Allied aircraft flew over 14,000 sorties, lost 127 of them. In the airborne landings on both flanks of the beaches, there were almost 2,400 aircraft and 867 gliders that were used. And you had a Navy. Don't forget about the Navy. So the, the Navy operation was called Neptune. It involved huge amounts of forces, including almost 7,000 vessels, over 1,200 combat ships, and 4,000 landing ships, 700 plus ancillary crafts, 800 merchant vessels, merchant vessels helping out. Almost 200,000 people were assigned to the, the naval effort. 53,000 almost were U.S. and about 113,000 were British and about 5,000 from other, other countries. Here's your day. The landing was so huge on D-Day that it was not all accomplished on D-Day, but took another five full days. So June 11th, which was actually D plus five. So these are, these are the totals. You can see them there. Look how many troops were there and vehicles and how many tons of supplies were landed on the beach. And then millions more people back home provided that support. So including the troops who landed in, in Normandy and those supporting the, the, the effort at, at, on land and, and at sea, and those millions of people, that's what it took to bring this thing off. So the, the museum there at Portsmouth has this, this photo, which we showed just before. But here's the thing to consider. Would you do this? Would you do this? You see, for the contractor of today, here's the vision that you've got to implant in your mind. Make a part of your thinking. You've got to see this. Can you imagine being 18 years old, jumping off a landing craft through a hail of gunfire, and if you survived and were able to make it across the beach, you then had to scale cliffs and overpower concrete bunkers holding entrenched machine gun crews. Could you do that? So it's important to remember moments like these because they point to the greatness of our country and our leaders. They remind us of the importance of leaders and the skills learned and inherent that are a part of leadership. There was lots of planning and leadership to be sure, but there was one guy in charge. Ultimately, General Dwight David Ike Eisenhower was the guy in charge. Win or lose, the ball was in his court. He had the title of Supreme Allied Commander. And on June 5th, the day before the invasion, he drafted a handwritten statement written with the knowledge that it would be published should the invasion fail, which was a very real possibility. In it, he praised his troops, the Navy and the Air Force for, quote, doing all that bravery could accomplish 
but responsibility and blame for the failure of the mission would lie with him alone. So General Eisenhower realized that he had ultimate responsibility, but that he knew that his crew had to carry out the mission, complete the project, and it had to be on time. So Ike addressed his troops just before the invasion, and he said, the eyes of the world march with you. Everybody in our industry realizes that things are still pretty grim out there. So we might question on a daily basis whether we can survive until the next job, the next month, the next week, tomorrow. But put it all into perspective. Let's say Coach Gary is going to wave his magic wand and give you a choice, which is learn everything you possibly can right now to protect your family, your business, and your industry today and into tomorrow, or or become that 18-year-old standing in the landing craft, watching the ramp let down onto the beach, and machine gun fire sweeping everything that moves. And they didn't even have Kevlar helmets and flak jackets back then. Well, I'm not sure that I have the courage anymore for that, but I'm, I'm thankful that many had it and that many still do. But how about you? me in our industry. You know, it might feel like a war, but it's not, really. If uh, bullets are flying, they're made of rubber and they can sting, but they're not going to kill us. So let's be worthy of the legacy we've inherited from those who gave so much on D-Day and all the days. We must protect that legacy. So the question for you is this, can you jump out of that landing craft and lead the invasion then or would you lead your company today? The choice is yours. I want to tell you a story about Point du Hoc. An extremely important part of the, of the D-Day landing was the mission of a company of U.S. Army Rangers to take over a position currently held by a German machine gun and, and artillery emplacement. It's uh, Point du Hoc. It's another look at it here. So their guns would be trained on the troops coming ashore, and so their their removal was was mandatory. You can see how narrow the beach is, how tall the cliff, how tall the cliffs. Please realize that this group of about 225 rangers was was to attack these guns at this place called Point to Hawk, and and you can see the enormity of the task because the point was protected by these hundred foot high vertical cliffs just just off of a short beach. But you got to see you got to see this next picture. This is the Rangers mission. And their mission was to come ashore, to scale these cliffs in the face of overwhelming machine gun and rifle fire, aim down the cliffs and at the Rangers as they were climbing up. About 100 of the Rangers actually survived and went on to complete the mission but over half were lost. And let's not forget this. Every ranger was a volunteer. Such is the heritage of our country. Well, bringing this back to the present day, compare your lot in life to that of a young army ranger while, while he is contemplating the enormity of the task before him. Let's say that you have the choice of trading places with him. You can either trade places and scale those cliffs or work like crazy and figure out a way to make your company the successful business that it deserves to be. Sometimes it feels like the competition is playing dirty, that things aren't fair and the economy sucks and your business is just hanging on by a thread. Life is tough. You finish the sentence because it's your life. But how did those rangers get to the top? They wanted their goal more than the enemy wanted to deny them. And that's a big part of the secret of life, isn't it? Plus, the rangers had a secret weapon. They had, they had artillery of their own. Because offshore lay the U.S. Navy, which could deliver a barrage of its own. And the Navy had plenty of ammo, the best guns, and more experienced people. The rangers had the Navy in their corner of the ring, 
They just had to make the call and ask for the help. So here's the thing. For us in the masonry industry, we've got our own version of the Navy. We happen to call it the MCAA. And they've got plenty of ammo, and they know how to deliver it, and, and they've got the best people around to make it all happen. These days, it's a much easier call to make than the one that the Rangers radio man had to make back then. But let's face facts. Even with the Navy's help, the task before the Rangers was daunting, and it was not likely to succeed. But it had to, had to succeed. It had to succeed. There was no plan B. This made their accomplishment all the more remarkable. Actually, the, the enormity of the mission probably helped the Rangers because the, the German artillery overlooked this possibility at first, thinking that it was impossible, until they were completely overrun. These days, you may have no plan B either. And while that can be scary, it can also be an opportunity. You and your competitors are all looking at the same 100-foot high cliffs blocking the pathway to success. Right now, your competitors very much doubt that they can make it. You, on the other hand, have got to believe that you can. To help you with that, remember where you came from, everything that your country has gone through and the paths laid out by the pioneers ahead of you. For some of them, their efforts cost them everything. But they did it willingly because they expected greatness from you. Your efforts in business and your love for your country and for your family and your community and neighbors. A wise man once said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Ultimate sacrifices of others on your behalf carry with them an obligation to do your very best, as long as it takes. Anything less would cheapen the value of their sacrifice. So the question comes up again. If you absolutely had to choose, would you lead your company to survive now and to succeed later? Or would you choose to scale those cliffs and face the fire from those machine guns? Lives and livelihoods hang in the balance. It's your choice. But before you choose, I want you to consider these next couple of things. Because I'd like to bring in President Ronald Reagan. And you might be questioning what he could possibly teach us about leadership and management of construction projects and, and job sites. And Fair questions, I'll grant you, and they deserve some answers. So let's begin with a little history. Reagan was elected to office in 1980, and this is what the but the country's economic landscape looked like. There was double-digit inflation. Home mortgages in the high teens, 17%. There was an oil crisis and a hostage crisis in the Middle East. Hey, it changed the mortgage rates for unemployment rates, and things look remarkably similar today, don't they? The top marginal tax rate was 70%. Let me spell that out. S-E-V-E-N-T-Y, 70 what a joy it was back then as a contractor to take all of that risk and then give 70% of my profit to uncle. Yikes! Reagan cut income taxes, yet revenues to the federal government increased substantially, something we seem to forget today. Reagan also rebuilt the U.S. military. He was a staunch supporter of the Star Wars missile defense idea, which ultimately resulted in the, in the old Soviet Union giving up on the idea of world domination and resulted in its breakup into the several republics that we see now. Well, that's a synopsis from, from my viewpoint, but, but I'm not really here to talk about or argue uh, political points, but leadership style. President Reagan was known as the great communicator, and he was very effective at delivering his messages to other world leaders and, and to the American people. 
And, and that's what I want to get into today because there are certainly lessons for us. Let's look at some of the messages from the speeches he gave. One of his very memorable speeches occurred at the Berlin Wall. We forget that Germany was once divided, actually since the end of World War II, into East and West Germany. And in Berlin, the city, was divided into East and West. Over the years, people from the East were shot by border guards as they attempted to reach the freedom available in the West. Reagan came to Berlin on June 12, 1987, at the Brandenburg Gate, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In fact, the wall did come down shortly thereafter in 1989. It was torn down then. On January 28, 1986, most of America, including millions of school children, watched on television as the, as the shuttle Challenger was launched. Among the seven aboard was Christy McAuliffe, a teacher, which accounted for the, the millions of kids watching. Moments into the flight, it exploded. And all seven astronauts were killed, and all America mourned. I remember this so well. Later that evening, President Reagan addressed the nation on TV. And in his remarks were these words. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. Before he became president in a campaign speech he gave in support of another candidate, he reminded us of American greatness with his rendezvous with destiny speech. And he said, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us that we justified our brief moment here and that we did all that could be done. There is a takeaway from this lesson. Because in the midst of all of the economic carnage we've been seeing and the lack of work and the, the crew layoffs and the zero profit bids, many of us may be tempted to ask the question, what's the use? seems like our industry can't catch a break. And I don't care what the reporters and pundits say about the economy, that it's already on the rebound, that things are getting better by the minute, and so on. You know the drill. But we know the reality, because for many of us, business right now still sucks, which is why I urge that you take to heart the encouraging words of our 40th president. Other people have experienced misery the same and worse, and have come out of it. So our mission these days may simply be to hang in there another month, and then another, and then another. The future does not belong to the faint-hearted. Things will eventually get better. Can you see that we and our country do have a, re a rendezvous with destiny? I hope so. John F. Kennedy's inaugural address was given more than 50 years ago. I was a student back then, and we didn't study the speech nor take it to heart, which leads me to ask the question, why should we study the speech and take it to heart today? Because some might say, hey, coach, come on, that speech is ancient history. What's an old president from way back then going to teach us that we can use on a job site today? Well, you know what? We need to pay attention to it, not as ancient history, but as a speech for the ages. And there's a huge difference which you're about to find out. More importantly, you're going to find yourself wanting to incorporate his insight into your business. First, who was JFK? Well, short history lesson today. And as a full disclaimer, I appreciate that I, as a political conservative, am giving you this info about a Democrat. But having said that, in many ways, JFK is still admired today, even by conservatives, even me. Heck, he was pro-business. He was in favor of lower taxes, and he was strong on defense. Lots of good stuff. What's not to love? And it's fair to say that he is highly thought of now by both Democrats and Republicans. 
Well, John Fitzgerald Kennedy became the 35th president of the U.S., having first served as a senator from Massachusetts. He was a bona fide war hero in World War II. And, you know, he wasn't particularly uh, eloquent as a speaker in terms of flowing style and, and rhetoric, as, as seems to captivate us today. But his message was huge, and he did give us some lessons to live by then and to run our businesses by even now. So let's take a look at a couple of things he said back then and see whether we might use them today in our, in our own companies. So on inaugural day, 1961, Kennedy gave us this as he closed his speech with these words. Ask not, my, my fellow Americans, what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Today, fighting for your company's economic survival is, is doing what you can for your country. And then, in the summer of 1962, at Rice University in Texas, JFK challenged the nation, and he gave us a, a dose of his vision. He said this, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win, and the others too. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from, from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that of the temperature of the sun, and to do all this and do it right and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. How's that for a challenge? For the record, we did get there, and we got there in just seven years, July 1969. But what had happened two years before Apollo, land, Apollo 11 landed on the moon? Apollo 1 caught fire on the launch pad, and three astronauts were killed. Hurdles? You've got hurdles in your business? Well, listen, when you go from a bold proclamation by a president to a deadly fire to a successful landing all in seven short years, you get a glimpse, a vision of American greatness and innovation. Team, in the midst of this great recession, which threatens our country and our states and our communities, even our businesses and our families, we need to remember our heritage as Americans. What we are going through today is tough. But do our challenges seem as totally impossible as that which President Kennedy laid out for the country on that hot summer day? What can we learn from that message? Every time we begin a project, most of us are, are going to establish project control right here in our office and remotely build something through our crews. Your project might be a 300-foot-long uh, building or a 30-foot-long wall. And the specs might call out for something new, some, some untried materials, things that you've, you've never used before or which, you have, which have just been invented, the tolerances that defy logic, but insisted upon by the inspector, sometimes with incredible heat buildup, requiring extraordinary effort and skill to control the cracking, yet allow strength to increase through curing. And like that rocket, once we light the fuse and propel that project, we're constantly in communication. We're guiding it to a precise destination at a predetermined time, doing everything humanly possible 
to bring it in exactly where it's supposed to land. Thomas Paine is a patriot at the founding of our country. He wrote these words on December 23rd, 1776. The reason America was being invaded by the most powerful country in the world. Pretty serious stuff. These are the times to try, men's souls. Your business, your industry, your family might be experiencing some soul trying of its own. This country was never one to climb into a bunker and pull the sheets over our head and hope that things would pass. Historically, we've always taken the offensive when warranted. The moon wasn't coming to us, so we went to it. Our revolutionary army and navy didn't sit back and wait to be attacked. Their souls were indeed tried. Washington soldiers were freezing, little to eat, and not much in the way of clothing and shoes. But they still took the fight to the enemy, and they won. Yes, these days can try our very souls. But remember, we've been there before. We've been through worse, and we'll get through this. How? By being proactive. Staying involved in our industry and the politics which affected it. Taking the fight to the problem and not running from it. Truly, we shouldn't any longer be asking what the government can do for us. Let's find out what we can do for our businesses, our country, and our families. Will generations which follow us be able to look at what we have weathered, what we have accomplished, and what we have built? Well, I'd like to finish up with one of my favorite true stories, something that I experienced personally. It's, it's a great story, but it's going to expose a certain amount of prejudice on my side, which, which I hope you can overlook in favor of the lesson of the story and not my own failings. Can, can you do that? Okay. Well, I do have a story, and it's also a, it's also a salute, as you're soon going to see. So my wife Karen and I were on a cruise, and we were about to eat dinner that final night of the voyage. We went into the dining room. The seating was, was unassigned, but, but the maitre d' would show us to a table. And, you know, I always enjoy sitting at large tables to meet new folks, so we followed his lead. Well, walking through the dining room, I saw lots of available seats at plenty of large tables, none of which seemed to interest him. Everybody looked pretty interesting to me, except for the one table for four which had only one couple sitting there. I spied them, and they each had a good 25 years on me, pretty elderly. So I was sure it was the one table that I desperately needed to avoid. The maitre d' apparently thought differently, and he showed us to that table. And it has occurred to me after the fact that I had an extreme prejudice, and, and you can call it ageism if you like. You know, prejudice has a simple definition. It's judging before you know the facts. Whatever, I had prejudged ahead of time that this m evening's meal was going to be horrible. <laughs> and that's how we met Herb and Margot, two members of the greatest generation. This last year or two in my magazine columns, I've written a lot about leadership, and I, I looked at lessons from, from famous leaders from Abe Lincoln to, to General Eisenhower and MLK and JFK and FDR and so on. And you might think, hey, they're big and important, so they can be leaders. But what about me? I'm just a regular, ordinary person, which is precisely why you need to meet Herb and Margo. Talk about leaders. Herb was a World War II U.S. Army Air Force B-24 bomber pilot. And on one mission, after losing one of his one of his engines, he still managed to, to fly his, his plane back to base. On another mission over Munich right after uh, D-Day, he, he was the tail end Charlie, the very last plane in a formation of 400 B-24s on a bombing run. I, I can't even comprehend a group of planes that large, can you? Imagine what the sky looked like and, and how it all sounded. Well, his primary mission in this formation was to provide cover for the group so that, so that they were not attacked from the rear. During their raid over, over Munich, um, there was fierce anti-aircraft fire. Two of his crew members were hit and killed. 
He also lost two engines, both of them on the left side of the plane, making it difficult to control. After still dropping his bomb load over the target, he headed for his base, and he had to struggle to get the plane over the Alps, which is tough with just two engines. And then over the Adriatic Sea, he lost a third engine, began losing altitude, couldn't stay in the air, and finally had to ditch his plane in the sea. In doing so, he went through the windshield of the plane. But because of his skills as a pilot, he and the seven remaining crew members survived, and they were rescued at sea. And after that, Herb <laughs> flew two more missions. Pretty cool, huh? But what about Margot? Can she top Herb's story? Well, I think she can. And you guys probably won't believe it, but here goes. Margot was a Holocaust survivor. Yeah, that's right, she was imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. She was a young Jewish girl. She made friends with another Jewish girl in the, in the camp, Anne Frank. Yes, that Anne Frank. Sometime after Anne was gassed to death, right there in the camp, and before it was Margot's turn to suffer the same fate, the camp was liberated by British paratroopers. And the image of those paratroopers became the title of the book she wrote, When the Sky Rained Umbrellas. So you see, to the child Margot, who had never seen a parachute before, she thought they looked like umbrellas. Team, we actually ate dinner with these two heroes, despite my best intentions and, and my prejudices. Anybody else out there wanting a, a dinner like that one? I see hands all over the place. So why did I want to bring these two regular, ordinary, but extraordinary people to your attention? Well, today is a time to remember, and we need to remember and salute the people who shaped our world and made our country what it is. My most recent messages to contractors have, have all been about hanging in there and keeping their businesses and their families afloat and dealing with change. It's called leadership. It's no different for the people in our neighborhood and in our community. Sure, the economy is nasty and things really look bad. And we wonder how we'll all survive. We're kind of prejudging things, though. So let's put this all into perspective. Can I give you the real message for today? Well, here it is. Because whatever you're facing, is it as bad as a pilot with a shot up plane, two crewmen killed, three of your engines shot out, losing altitude over the Adriatic, with the lives of seven other people in your hands, and you need to put the thing down in the water? I don't think so. Or are things as bad for you as they were for a little girl trying to survive on almost no food with a monstrous jail keeper? her family and friends dropping dead around her or disappearing altogether? Probably not. So before our next pity party, let's all resolve to remember that teenage girl and the 20-something pilot both navigating and surviving the worst that life can throw at them, rescued by paratroopers, rescued by at sea. But they survived. They met each other and they eventually even lived in California although we, we did lose Margot this past year. And when you think about keeping your business or your community or your family and keeping them afloat and, and, and whether you can lead through the changes that you see all around you, you think about Herb and seven other guys bleeding and bobbing around in the water. Now that's really hanging on and keeping afloat. Today, by comparison, what we have to go through is basically a piece of cake, isn't it? We can do this. The history of our great country has taught us that we can get through just about anything. You can do this. You can lead. And we remember that, especially today, and we salute those who have made this possible. Well, in spite of my prejudice, I met two of the most fascinating people ever, but let me say this, because without hesitation, that dinner was the best part of the entire trip, and I almost missed it. So let me encourage you and me to not make stupid judgments before we know all the facts. 
to seek wisdom and encouragement from those who've gone before us. Remember the sacrifice of others for you. Great leadership and tenacity that they've shown, even though many of them would not have thought themselves leaders or brave or tenacious. This stuff is in your genes. It's in your heritage. You can do this. You will do this. You are able to lead your team right now through absolutely anything because you're going to follow the model of those who came before you. The point is this. Our freedoms only began in 1776. The battle to preserve and guarantee them continues to this day. At this very moment, people we all know personally are being deployed or serving in the military or getting ready to go again or are just returning. They are people from our neighborhoods, churches, synagogues, community service clubs, recent graduates from high school and college, carrying that same torch of freedom and ensuring our liberties. American history is filled to overflowing with accounts of the heroism and valor which have saved and preserved this nation along with her traditions and values. Names like Lexington and Concord, Gettysburg, the Western Front. From the sands of, of Iwo Jima to the, the Battle of Midway, the Chosin Reservoir, Quezon, and so many others. It's almost a sin to not list more. This is your heritage. Your ability to lead stems directly from people like these. That's why now you realize that you can lead as necessary. And finally, please allow me as one patriotic American to another to close with a quote from a non-American one of the greatest leaders of World War II, Winston Churchill. So this Brit really sums up the American spirit and philosophy, which has to become your spirit, your philosophy. If you accept what he says and acknowledge your legacy as an American, you will be the one who can lead your team through absolutely anything. And now, here's Sir Winston. Never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in. Except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. We stood all alone a year ago. Our account was closed. We were finished. All this tradition of ours. This part of the history of this country were gone and finished and liquidated. Very different is the mood today. Instead, our country stood in the gap. There was no flinching and no thought of giving in. And by what seemed almost a miracle to those outside these islands, though we ourselves never doubted it, we now find ourselves in a position where I can say that we can be sure that we have only to persevere to conquer. Remember how we got here? Remember where you're going? Team, I, I hope and trust, heck, I know that you will take these words to heart and be the leader you were destined to be. This is Coach Gary. Thank you, everybody, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. <laughs>